Hi everybody and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. As um, quite a few of you very nicely pointed out, I had made a mistake last week and I had gotten mixed up and was talking about last week being Palm Sunday, which would have made this week Easter, but actually this week is Palm Sunday and next week is Easter. And I was a little baffled as to how I could have gotten that mixed up. Um, and I want to show you something here. Um, my wall calendar, which I got because it's got beautiful, lovely, scenic pictures in it. Let me show you this page from my wall calendar. It actually has Palm Sunday and Easter written on the wrong dates. And um, I had just glanced up at it and went from that. And um, since I'm not playing on the worship team for Easter this year, um, the other keyboardist is playing. I just didn't have it so rock solid in my head. So I am sorry there was that mix up. If I looked on my day planner or my phone, it was correct, but it was my wall calendar that was off. So yes, today is Palm Sunday. I want to wish you a wonderful Palm Sunday, uh, celebrating the day that Jesus rode in triumph into Jerusalem. Um, and then there was that last week then before he was crucified on the following Friday. Now we have been going through what Jesus had to say to his disciples and to Father God during this last time that he had with, with his disciples and, and the opportunity to pray with them there, um, which was at this Last Supper, the Passover meal that they, that they um, had together and then um, went into the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus uh, prayed to the Father um, uh, some more about just, you know, what was going to be coming. <laughs> and then he was arrested there. So we have gone now through um, John. These are these are accounts, all of these wonderful words are in John. And we had gone through John 16, 18. And now I want to finish John 16 this week. And then next week on actual Resurrection Sunday. I'm sorry. <laughs> on Resurrection Sunday, I want to really go through this incredible prayer that Jesus had prayed to his Father. These last important words that he was just sharing with God the Father before he was crucified. And I'm, I'm just grateful to have given this, this passage, these passages attention during this season, because as I've said before, if these words were important to Jesus to say as some of his very last words um, to, like I said, both his disciples and his Father in heaven before he would be crucified, then I want to give them attention and treat them as important also. So we're going to start out and we're going to go ahead and read John 16. I'm going to go back to verse 16 before we go on. So we'll go John 16, 16 through 33. Jesus starts out here by saying, In a little while you won't see me anymore, but a little while after that you will see me again. Some of the disciples asked each other, what does he mean when he says, in a little while you won't see me, but then you will see me, and, and I'm going to the Father. And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. Jesus realized they wanted to ask him about it, so he said, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said in a little while you won't see me, but a little while after that you will see me again. I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly and he will grant your request because you use my name. 
you haven't done this before, ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. I have spoken of these matters in figures of speech, but soon I will stop speaking figuratively and will tell you plainly all about the Father. Then you will ask in my name. I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. Yes, I came from the Father into the world, and now I will leave the world and return to the Father. Then his disciples said, At last you are speaking plainly and not figuratively. Now we understand that you know everything, and there's no need to question you. From this we believe that you came from God. Jesus asked, Do you finally believe? But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And then next week, as we begin into chapter 17, he will direct his, his words, um, not to the disciples anymore, but to his Father in heaven. So Jesus is genuinely trying to prepare his disciples that there is going to come a very rough time. And they're going to have to realize that he cannot stay with them for very much longer. And he said, in a little while you won't see me anymore, but then you will see me again. And not only would they see Jesus after he resurrected from the grave, but um, in the presence of the Holy Spirit after Pentecost, they will once again be able to be really close to Jesus again through the presence of the Holy Spirit in their heart, in their life. And so they would have him back in their life again and in a kind of a close way. If we look here where it says in um, John 16, 20, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. And, you know, Jesus knew what was coming, and he knew that it was going to be some dark days um, before he was resurrected. They truly loved Jesus, and they had just basically given their whole lives to follow him. And, you know, Peter said one time, and Jesus was asking, you know, after a bunch of, of the various followers of his had left him because Jesus was saying some things they didn't want to accept. And I'll give you the scripture reference below here. But um, Jesus turned and, and to his disciples and said, Are you going to leave me too? And Peter just said, Lord, where else could we go? Where, where else could we go? Um, they loved him so much. And so it was probably very hard for them to truly believe that he was trying to tell them that he was going to die um, and that he would not be able to stay with them like for years and years. So, and he didn't even said that he would come back. He'd be resurrected after three days. He'd been trying to tell them this. I want to go ahead and look at Mark 16.10. This scripture is talking about um, when the disciples were kind of hiding away out of absolute terror for their lives, um, you know, right after Jesus had been crucified. And Mary Magdalene had gone to Jesus' grave and um, had been, you know, had found out that he was raised from the dead. And it says here in verse 10, she went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. And it's just a, a, a place there where Mark talks about how that they were weeping. They were just absolutely heartbroken. I can't even imagine the, the pain they were feeling and how 
uh, devastating it was to have known that Jesus had been killed. Let's go ahead and also look at Luke 23, 27. This is talking here about the crowds that were uh, kind of gathered around as Jesus was having to you know, haul the wood of his cross up to um, the place to be crucified. And it says, a large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. They were just heartbroken. And Jesus knew, was trying to warn them that it was going to be like that. And then in John 20, 20, you know, Jesus had also said here to them that you will oh, find yourself suddenly filled with joy. And this is what it says, Jesus has now appeared to them. He had just suddenly appeared standing among them in that room, and, and he said, Peace be with you. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. So just as Jesus had said, when he came back, even though there, there had been grieving so much, they would become filled with joy. And indeed, they were. Now, as a mother, as someone who has had kids, this description that Jesus has here of their sorrow being somewhat like what a woman has to go through before she has the incredible joy of having given birth to this new child. Um, he says in verse 21, it would be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. And Bill has said before that it astounds him how quickly a brand new mother forgets what she's just gone through and she's just so excited and happy and full of joy to have this new life, this new baby in her arms. And I can say from experience that um, knowing that child is there and having them just give you the baby um, is it's worth everything you could possibly go through to get there. And this is a neat example of how the joy can follow a very difficult time. And then he says in verse 22, So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. No one would be able to take it away from them. That word rob that's used there is a hero, like a hero, <laughs> it's a hero. And that word means that you're gonna be bearing something away, taking it away, carrying it off, to lift something from the ground, remove, to take it up. And um, it's used quite commonly in the New Testament. And in addition to a literal usage of like taking something away, um, it's also used to talk about Christ taking away sin, um, of believers being able to put aside their negative attitudes, and of taking up a cross. It can also be used um, to talk about the devil snatching away the word of God from people who have been hearing it. And so this word of something just to be taken away, snatched up and taken away, is used here where Jesus said to them, no one can rob you of that joy. No one would be able to snatch it up or take it away from them. And Jesus is talking here in verse 23 that they were going to be able to go right to the Father directly, using his name to make requests before God. Um, he said they hadn't been doing it before, but if they use his name, they um, will be able to receive and they can have abundant joy. Ah, that's just, it is so beautiful. So let's look at Matthew, look at Matthew 7, 7 through 11. These are words from a very famous message that Jesus came, gave called the Sermon on the Mount. And he says here, Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? So Jesus is talking about how the Father wants to hear these prayers and wants to give good blessings and things from his grace into our lives. And I want to go now uh, back a little bit here um, in this, this um, what Jesus is sharing with him here at the, Pen the Passover Supper. I'm going to go back now to John 15, 11. He says, I've told you these things so that you may be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. You know, as he says here now in um, verse 24 in chapter 16, you will receive and you will have abundant joy. He's making it so clear that he and the Father want to bring joy into their lives. And he's telling us now that he wants to bring joy into our lives. And one of the things that Jesus did quite often um, during his extensive teaching that he did during his time of ministry on earth was he used parables. Um, he would use stories to help illustrate a, a real truth. And he didn't always speak in extremely clear, like, this is just a plus B plus C kind of situations. He would tell a story and it would help to really illustrate the truth that he was trying to share. And um, he says here in verse 25, John 16, I have spoken to these matters in figures of speech, but soon I will stop speaking figuratively and will tell you plainly all about the Father. Um, he wants us to really understand goes on to say, you'll ask in my name. And I'm not saying I'll ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. Let's go to Psalm 78, 1 and 2. O oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Um, these, these parables, these stories that help us to, if we can kind of understand what's being said, then we can understand and grasp a truth that we need to know. And so let's go ahead now, and I want to look in John 10, and we're going to read 6 and the beginning of 7. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. And so and he goes on to explain about one of his parables. And so there were times when people didn't necessarily come immediately grasp what he was saying. And then there were times when Jesus would very carefully explain it to them. But he's telling the disciples here that he's going to be speaking to them very plainly about the Father and wanting them to know him. And um, later on with the presence of the Holy Spirit um, in their life and in our lives, we can learn so much about God. And the, the Word of God can be used to help us to understand what God the Father is like, what Jesus, Jesus is like, what the Holy Spirit is like, what they want of us and how they feel about us. Um, we can know it. And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 28, Yes, I came from the Father into the world, and now I will leave the world and return to the Father, which must have been pretty difficult words for them to hear, but he's trying to really let them know. Um, I want to go ahead and I'm going to go back in John a little ways to 13.3. says here, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So this was spoken of by John earlier in this book that he had written, and now Jesus is saying it very plainly. And I want us to go ahead and go uh, to the very beginning of this gospel that John wrote, and I want you to listen to how he is introducing Jesus in the beginning of John 1. So I'm going to read John 1, 1 through 18. It'll become very clear that Jesus is the Word. 
But I want you to be aware, of course, from the very beginning that when John is speaking of, of the Word, he's speaking of Jesus. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. Of course, this is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle who is writing this. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. And it, that is like the beginning point of John beginning to tell us about the life of his beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. And here we see Jesus' words right before he's going to give his life for us in payment for sin. Jesus saying in verse 28, back in John, 7, John 16, Yes, I came from the Father into the world, and now I will leave the world and return to the Father. And I love how at the beginning of John that description of him is so in-depth about him being the light of the world and why he came and how he was revealing the love that's in God the Father's heart. The, the disciples then were like, well, you know, I, now you're speaking more plainly, and we do really believe that you have come from God. You know, they, they're telling him that they really do believe that. So here in verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, Jesus asked him, do you finally believe? But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when you will be scattered each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. They, they're going to be terrified and scattered. Jesus is trying to kind of warn them of what's coming. Um, it's interesting, so interesting, because um, even in the Old Testament, there was like prophecy about this happening. And I want to go to Zechariah 13.7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn against the lambs. It's just that, that saying here that when you strike down the shepherd, the sheep are scattered. Well, let's go now to Matthew um, 26. And I want to um, read, starting in verses 31 through 56, where... This was just directly fulfilled. Now here in verse 31, this is you know, Matthew 26, Jesus will directly quote the scripture that I just shared with you out of Zechariah. Okay, they are on their way, by the way, to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus will be praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me. 
For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Just like in Zechariah. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Which he did. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they just couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. And to go up and greet someone you know with a kiss was like a common way of greeting. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you've come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? that describe what must happen now. Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there preaching, teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. And at that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. When in one of the other accounts, when uh, the men came up and asked if he was Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am. And they literally got knocked off their feet because he spoke the tetragrammaton. He spoke the I am proclaiming his deity. And the power of that, just released by those words, literally knocked the men down. And then we have one of the disciples coming up to defend Jesus and cutting off the, the ear of one of the servants, and that was Peter. We can tell that from other, from other scriptures. And Jesus actually put the man's ear back on and healed it. But this is, you know, Jesus telling them this must be fulfilled because, you know, it's what he came for was to save us by shedding his blood so that we could be forgiven of everything we've ever done against God, every sin. And it does, you know, say there, that these terrified disciples fled. And just like he said to them before they ever went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, you will desert me. <laughs> um, you will leave me alone. But the Father God, Father God will be with me. And um, he knew that was what was going to happen.
Now, of course, Peter absolutely said there's no way in the world that he would ever deny Jesus. He just would never do it. But I want to go into Luke. We're going to go into Luke 22 and just read 54 through 62. Now, here Jesus will be arrested. So they arrested him and led him to the high priest's home, and Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I am not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he's a Galilean too. And Peter said, and, and even spoke up with an oath, it says in one of the other accounts, Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. So Jesus knew, um, and by telling him these words ahead of time, you know, helped Peter to understand that Jesus knew this was going to happen. And of course, it just broke Peter's heart that he could possibly have denied his Lord that way. And he went off and wept bitterly. We also know that um, that that weeping was truly repentance. It wasn't despair to the point of just rejecting everything and going into deep bitterness. He he wept um, out of absolute repentance and heartache that he could have hurt Jesus like that and denied him. And he wanted to be restored to Jesus so much. And of course, we see that happen. Peter actually is one of the first disciples. He and John are one of the first disciples to go see the empty tomb. So as we complete chapter 16, Jesus says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Um, that word that, that has been translated into many trials and sorrows is thlipsis. It is thlipsis. Um, it is a pressure. You know, he's talking about what they're going to encounter in the world um, as, as they love and serve him. Pressure, oppression, stress, anguish, tribulation, adversity, affliction, something crushing squashing, squeezing, some kind of distress. Um, if you put your hand on a stack of loose items and you just compress them down, this is thalipsis. Putting a lot of pressure on that which has been free and unfettered. Um, it's like a spiritual bench pressing. Um, this word thalipsis is also used when you're crushing grapes or olives in a press. And Jesus knows they're going to come under an awful lot of struggle and pressure in the world. This here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. That's the the thalipsis, the being the trying to be crushed down. But he says, "Take heart, because I have overcome the world." As he's preparing them and trying to warn them about what was coming, he also has been speaking of the joy that he and God the Father want to bring into their life, and um, that they will. He, their prayers will be heard. And all of these words, I'm sure, then came back to the disciples and to us all these years later to see what Jesus was trying to prepare them for and what he knew was coming. And um, so that they could know that God was still in this. And they knew, once they realized Jesus had raised from the dead, they knew that's exactly what he told them he would do. He knew what he was talking about. This was the very words of God that had been spoken into their life. I'm going to go back in John into 14 and just reread. We've gone through this pretty recently, but reread verse 27. Jesus says here, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. 
and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Even though this pressure and these trials and the attacks of the enemy will come, I have, he says, I'm giving you a peace that nothing in the world can give you. And that peace got them through so much in all of these years following. In Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. We can have peace. I want to go to Romans 8, 37. I love Romans 8. If you've been following with Jesus for a while, you've heard me say that. Romans 8, 37. He says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And he, you know, uh, Paul had been speaking there to the Romans about all the kinds of persecution and hardship that can come, but nothing can separate us from the love of God. And victory is ours through Jesus Christ. I want to go to 1 John 5. And once again now, this is written by the Apostle John. He always called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. <laughs> I think that's really cool. Okay, so in 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I want to read 11 and 12. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. So all that Jesus was going to be enduring as now he would be arrested and then the next day crucified, was for our sake so that we could have life, we could have forgiveness, we could have peace and joy and hope and a future. And Jesus knew when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane that it was going to be really, really hard because not only was our sin placed on him, but the overwhelming shame of it. He had never known that before. The condemnation, the humiliation, all of that was heaped on him on the cross. And worst of all, because he became sin for us on that cross, he took the curse for us, God had to turn his back on him. And Jesus was utterly alone. For however long those that time was, it must have been unbelievable for him to to not only be enduring the physical agony, which I think was terrible, but even worse was all of this incredible guilt and darkness piled on him, and his father had to turn away. That's why Jesus cried out, oh My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he did it because he loves us. And he did it until the price was paid and he could say it is finished and then commend his spirit into his father's hands. So I want us to just, you know, go back, read those words that Jesus was speaking while he knew he had a little bit of time left and all the encouragement that he was trying to bring his disciples and all the perspective that things can get really hard, but that he would be with them is also words for us, that no matter what we ever have to face, he will be with us. He has paid this price. He wants joy for us. He wants us to know that we can ask God the Father in Jesus' name, and he hears us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am just so grateful that we have the privilege of honoring you for this incredibly difficult sacrifice you made for us. And then we're celebrating next week that you were resurrected, you were raised from the dead, 
You are alive and you are seated at the right hand of God, the Father. You are victorious. You are our King. You are our God. You are our Lord and you are our friend. Oh my goodness, what an incredible thing that is. Lord, help us, no matter what's going on in our life, to maintain the perspective that because we can have you in our life, despite circumstances, we can have peace, we can find joy, we can, we can be patient, um, we can be kind, we can be forgiving because of your very presence in our life. Lord, teach us to love the way you do. Teach us ways that we can tell this world how greatly you love them and that they are lost in darkness without you. Lord, I just pray we can be bold and that we can believe you for being the real true light of the world that you are. I love you and I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, unlike what I said last week when I said happy um, Palm Sunday, this week actually is Palm Sunday. And I pray that it can be a blessed uh, blessed uh, day for you. If you can find a church to rejoice with and, and be able to worship and to hear God's word, I think that would be wonderful. Um, if anybody would like to hear our service and to... Um, be able to share in what we're doing for Palm Sunday. We'd love to have you. It will be 11 o'clock as usual um, uh, today, and um, it will be live. You can interact, and then it will be on YouTube afterwards. And so there is a orange circle in the end screen that has arrows on it. That will lead you to the YouTube channel for it, or there'll be a link in the description below. We'd love to have you share it if you'd like to. Um, and then next week, um, and of course, I'll do Tea with Jesus and give a for sure announcement with that, but the live will be at 10 o'clock next week because we're going to have quite a few Easter services. So, And I should be online next week because I'm, I'm not playing for this one. So, all righty, listen, I love you guys, and I will get going. Be blessed. Go back and read these words. See the love of Christ as he speaks to you. All righty. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.